Thank you. Uh, the title of my talk tonight is The Crisis of U.S. Trade Unionism and What Needs to Be Done. U.S. Trade Unionism is in crisis. Union density has been declining throughout the United States since 1955, the year of the American Federation of Labor, Congress of Industrial Organizations, or AFL-CIO merger. With union density peaking at 35% that year, increasing globalization over the last 30 years has led to the dramatic weakening of the industrial unions in the basic manufacturing sectors of the U.S. economy, such as auto, steel, and rubber. The most current statistics published by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, or BLS, demonstrate the severity of this problem. Private sector union density in 2011 registered only 6.9%, which is indicative of the hemorrhaging of millions of members in manufacturing combined with labor being unable to successfully create new bargaining units in both mature and newly emerging industries. While much smaller than the private sector, the public sector continues to be a relatively bright spot for U.S. trade unionism in, in the 21st century second decade. With union density among federal, state, and municipal government employees exceeding that found in the private sector by fivefold at 37 percent, public sector unionism is relatively healthy. This might soon change, however, with the recent attacks by state governments commencing in early 2011. The plummeting of union density has weakened U.S. labor's collective bargaining power and all but ended utilizing the strike as a weapon. Since the BLS began keeping records in 1947, U.S. strike activity has hit record lows in the past few years. In 2010, there were only 11 strikes and or lockouts involving 1,000 or more workers for a total of 45,000 workers, while in 2009 there were but five work stoppages with 13,000 workers of that size. These figures represent a dramatic decline from an annual average of nearly 270 strikes, comprising more than 1.3 million employees from 1971 through 1980. Moreover, the continued erosion of private sector union density and the belief that dramatic steps had to be taken to reverse this dismal state of affairs was the primary motivation for dissident unions succeeding from the AFL-CIO in the summer of 2005 and subsequently establishing the Change to Win Federation that September. This crisis in U.S. trade unionism first became apparent shortly after Ronald Reagan's election to the U.S. presidency in November 1980. After firing the striking air traffic controllers in August 1981 and breaking their union, things went rapidly downhill for the U.S. labor movement. In addition to declining union density, the 1980s were characterized by numerous lost strikes, including the 1983 Greyhound bus driver's work stoppage, the 1985-86 local P9 strike against Hormel, and the 1988 United Paper Workers local 14 walkout against International Paper. Throughout the 1990s, unions suffered major defeats in additional work stoppages, including Staley, Caterpillar, and Detroit newspapers, although the victorious 1997 United Parcel Service strike conducted by the Teamsters remained anomalous in this bleak landscape. In this paper, I will argue that the crisis of U.S. trade unionism in the early 21st century is ultimately the crisis of business unionism which was embraced by labor from 1945 to 1975, the golden age of the U.S. trade union movement. This approach remained viable circa 1945 to 1975, but sowed the seeds of U.S. trade unionism's destruction beginning in the late 1970s, early 1980s, as business unionism provided diminishing returns to a faltering U.S. trade union movement. U.S. trade unionism's serious troubles resulted in John Sweeney's election as the AFL-CIO president in 1995. Serving in this position through late summer 2009 as a union reformer, Sweeney sought to replace a sclerotic business unionism with a variant of social movement unionism in an attempt to revitalize U.S. labor. While Sweeney's implementation of a version of social movement unionism was a small step in the right direction, I contend that for the U.S. trade union movement to have a fighting chance in the 21st century, new approaches must transcend Sweeney's preliminary reform efforts. This paper will proceed in the following manner. I will briefly discuss the explosive growth of industrial unionism during the New Deal era before examining and analyzing the trade union movement's use of business unionism during labor's golden era, which covers the period from 1945 to 1975. 
I will then detail the unraveling of business unionism circa 1977 to 1995, and then we'll discuss the Sweeney's administration's implementation of a type of social movement unionism in response to business unionism's failure. Next, I will outline an alternative mode of trade unionism designed to transcend this current form of social movement unionism if there is to be a chance at revitalizing the U.S. trade union movement before concluding the paper. The 1930s signaled a revival of the U.S. trade union movement. In an effort to resuscitate a devastated economy, the 1933 passage of the National Industrial Recovery Act among other provisions, offered legal protections for union organizing and for collective bargaining among most private sector workers. Upon the declaration of the National Recovery Act's codes of fair competition being unconstitutional in 1935, the Wagner Act's implementation later that same year expanded federal coverage for pr private sector collective bargaining activities. Several months after the Wagner Act's passage, the AFL convention debated the Federation's organizing strategy. Some union leaders, such as the United Mine Workers president, John L. Lewis, argued for the necessity of creating industrial unions. That is, all of a facility's employees, irrespective of occupation and skill level, would be organized into a single labor organization in contradistinction to the craft unions organizing just the skilled workers at the work site. Upon walking out of the 1935 AFL convention, nine unions established the Committee for Industrial Organization and breathed new life into industrial unionism in the United States. This schism within the AFL was solidified in 1938 with the establishment of the Congress of Industrial Organizations, or also known as the CIO. The Wagner Act's passage and the CIO's formation resulted in enormous union growth. Both AFL and CIO unions targeted workers in the dominant manufacturing industries such as steel, automotive, and rubber for organizing, often vying against each other in union certification elections. Reviving militant tactics such as the sit-down strike or plant occupation, first initiated by the industrial workers of the world two decades earlier, the CIO's industrial unions began to grow in size as workers poured into these energetic organizations upon the conclusion of victorious collective actions. The wave of sit-down strikes lasting from 1936 to 1938 spread beyond factories to many other industries and was particularly effective since employers were unable to replace strikers while subsequently experiencing losses in productivity. It was in the immediate post-war period when the CIO's industrial unions began to construct an embryonic business unionism. Six, de six decades earlier, the AFL's craft unions had already implemented a full-blown business unionism at the time of the Federation's 1886 formation. Business unionism possesses a number of distinctive characteristics. The first feature can be described as a service model of unionism, where unionists passively consume various goods and services, including wages, benefits, and a grievance procedure, negotiated by the union and provided by union staff. In this capacity, union officials are viewed as executives who are responsible for administering the business. A second emphasis in, is union officers concentrating their time and energy on narrowly defined issues appearing in the collective bargaining agreement. Moreover, union members' complaints are only dealt with if they represent specific contractual violations. A third attribute would be the belief that labor and management share all of the same concerns and are partners in assuring the success of the business, even when management has no desire to work with the union. Fourth, the labor organization is treated as a large bureaucracy headed by union leaders who are physically and ideologically separated from the rank and file workers through the presence of professional staff. In this setting, union leaders develop the organization's policies while the member's major role is to consume services provided by union officials and staff. Moreover, the members are not expected to regularly participate in union affairs unless specifically called upon to do so by union officers. From 1945 to 1975, business unionism successfully increased wages and benefits for the union membership through collective bargaining. These improvements obtained by the industrial unions were transferred to other unionized companies' workers within the same industry through pattern bargaining. 
Industrial unions in auto and steel, for example, utilize pattern bargaining by targeting a particular employer to obtain what the union considered to be a strong contract. Once that agreement was finalized, negotiations commenced with another major employer in the same industry trying to attain a contract at least as good as the first agreement. Pattern bargaining not only functioned within an industry, but also between industries as advancements achieved by one labor organization in an industry inspired unions in other industries to negotiate comparable agreements. From the late 1940s through the early 1980s, pattern bargaining was crucial in taking wages out of competition and in maintaining union power. George Meany, the AFL-CIO's first president from 1955 to 1979, and a former plumber was the quintessential business unionist who had virtually no interest in organizing the unorganized, even though a chief reason motivating the 1955 AFL-CIO merger was to encourage the unionization efforts of member unions. With union density dropping from its peak of 35% at the time of the AFL-CIO merger to 27.4% in 1971, Meany hardly appeared upset. When asked in 1972 why union density was falling, he hastily responded, I don't know, I don't care. Meany's regime was best characterized for its venomous anti-communism at home and abroad and for his re resolute support for both U.S. foreign policy and the nation's involvement in the Vietnam War. Additionally, he unceasingly defended race privilege in the workplace while offering feeble support for both civil rights and the integration of the essentially lily-white craft union. Furthermore, he excoriated and often viciously attacked extremely liberal Democrats, peace demonstrators, environmentalists, feminists, and gay activists. And as reported in his, in his official biography, Meany bragged that he never walked a picket line in his life. In an attempt to defend union gains that were being jeopardized by declines in union density, the AFL-CIO made ambitious though unsuccessful attempts to modify labor legislation in the late 1970s. The Federation's first defeat occurred in March 1977 when a bill to legalize common situs picketing, that is the union having the right to picket other contractors and subcontractors at a construction site when its dispute only involved one sub subcontractor, lost on a narrow vote in, in the heavily Democratic 95th Congress. This result did not augur well for the AFL-CIO's more important reform effort, the Labor Law Reform Bill, which attempted to put more teeth into the Wagner Act. Although the bill cruised through the House by a margin of 257 to 163 in October 1977, it fell two votes short of cloture in the Senate on June 15, 1978. The two legislative losses in 1977 and 1978 were just the beginning of more serious problems for labor. Business unionism began to unravel by the early 1980s with the U.S. trade union movement being confronted by a host of economic and political changes. While business unionism possessed intrinsic weaknesses, these structural limitations had remained hidden for more than three decades. From 1945 through 1975, four factors had resulted in business unionism successfully raising union members' living standards. First, overall union density remain, remained fairly healthy in the range of 35% from 1945 to 1955, but falling to 25% in 1975, with the basic manufacturing industries comprising the core of union strength and a public sector union membership rapidly expanding during the 1960s and the 1970s. Second, due to the United States dominating world markets in the post-war era and the country experiencing significant economic growth, union influence flourished because of this favorable climate. Third, despite significant legislative defeats with the implementation of the anti-labor 1947 Taft-Hartley and 1959 Landrum-Griffin Act, a New Deal coalition provided a relatively favorable political environment for labor organization. And lastly, major corporations and heavily unionized industries did not challenge the union's right to exist as long as they continued to, to devote their energies only to collective bargaining and to contract administration. The economic situation, however, had changed by the early 1980s. With increases in worldwide competition, the slowing of economic growth, and the squeezing of profit rates, the United States no longer dominated the world market as it had for the three post-World -War, War II decades. Union density continued its downward trajectory with the traditionally unionized 
manufacturing industries, closing factories, and outsourcing jobs combined with newly emerging industries such as high tech, virulently battling unionization through enlisting union-busting consultants. Additionally, an inhospitable political environment represented by the termination of 11,000 members of the Professional Air Traffic Controllers Organization, or PATCO, by then President Reagan in August 1981, encouraged capital to adopt similar tactics in dealing with its private sector unions. Combined with the unraveling of the New Deal coalition, this did not bode well for labor. These forces lay bare the dynamics of business unionism, which experienced problems in continuing to deliver the economic goods to the union membership. This became obvious during contract negotiations in the early 1980s when U.S. unions engaged in concession bargaining. In exchange for accepting wage and benefit concessions, unions received the implementation of labor management cooperation programs. As business unionism was fraying, the AFL-CIO presidency changed hands after nearly a quarter of a century. Although one could contend that Lane Kirkland, president from 1979 to 1995, was slightly more progressive than Meany, in essence, the second AFL-CIO president, who can best be described as a bureaucrat's bureaucrat, shared the same business unionist perspective in Cold War politics as his predecessor and mentor. Upon the smashing of the PATCO strike in August 1981, Kirkland hesitantly supported the Solidarity March held in response, which assembled 250,000 trade unionists in the nation's capital, despite the interracial unions expressing a particularly enthusiastic reaction to this event. Instead of emboldening Kirkland, such zeal generated apprehension in the nation's top labor leader. As a substitute to organizing more such events, his alternative was to urge union members to continue to support Democratic candidates at the polls. While Solidarity Day failed to spur Kirkland towards taking additional actions, the rapid and accelerating deindustrialization of the U.S. economy throughout the 1980s and early 1990s also failed to alarm the Federation president. At the time, he proffered neither strategies nor any innovative ideas for responding to this decline, with, which battered both unionists and non-union workers alike. As opposed to being consumed with serious domestic issues, the AFL-CIO president appeared more concerned with his European travels, where he promoted the construction of pro-American-style business union in the former Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc countries upon communism's demise. Dissatisfaction with Kirkland's inattention to domestic trade union affairs contributed to the defeat of Thomas Donahue, Kirkland's hand-picked successor, and the election of John Sweeney and the new voice slate in 1995. Upon John Sweeney's ascendancy to the AFL-CIO presidency after the first contested election in the Federation's four-decade history, rank-and-file activists, progressive union staff members, and other labor supporters expressed hope that significant change was around the corner. Creating high expectations for himself, Sweeney, who promised during his campaign to revitalize the U.S. trade union movement through devoting massive resources to union organizing, remarked at a news conference shortly after taking office that his AFL-CIO presidential tenure should largely be gauged on his success at reversing labor's downward spiral. In contrast to the business unionism of Meany and Kirkland, Sweeney offered something different specifically a brand of social movement unionism to the battered AFL-CIO. Social movement unionism was first introduced into the worldwide lexicon in the late 1980s by the British labor scholar Peter Waterman, who used the term to describe a new politically radical militant unionism appearing in nations such as South Africa, Brazil, and South Korea. This concept, however, only gained widespread currency in the United States after the publication of Kim Moody's Workers in a Lean World in 1997. Unionism is an expansive term possessing multiple meanings. For the purposes of this paper, it will be used to describe a type of trade unionism where workers and their labor organizations construct coalitions with community groups in their quest for obtaining economic and social justice. As such, social movement unionism goes beyond confining the union agenda to only handling workplace issues and attempting to maximize the members' economic interests as negotiated in the contract. This brand of unionism, for example, is concerned with the devastating effects of growing economic inequality in the United States and the implementation of neoliberal economic policies. 
Moreover, in dealing with such issues, labor attempts to form coalitions with community organizations as well as immigrant, racial minority, women, and religious groups around the common agenda. Sweeney's ideology excited both union reformers and activists who felt that he would be more amenable than his forebears to aligning with liberal and social movements external to the AFL-CIO while encouraging the use of trade union militancy to achieve federation objectives. Reformers were also encouraged by Sweeney and his New Voice administration's commitment to spending increasing federation resources on campaigns to unionize millions of low-wage workers, many who were women, immigrants, and racial minorities. As a starting point in 1996, AFL-CIO leaders stated that $20 million would be devoted to the project with the amount increased to $30 million in 1997. Furthermore, unlike the negligible role it played during the Kirkland era, Sweeney determined that the AFL-CIO's organizing institute would be instrumental in these efforts. Redistributing federation resources was a necessary but not a sufficient condition for, make, for remaking a culture hospitable to union organizing. Realizing this, Sweeney introduced various innovative programs, including the creation of a corporate affairs department for emboldening shareholder activism, while in 1996 he introduced Union Summer, modeled after the civil rights movement's Freedom Summer, so that hundreds of college students and young workers could acquire union organizing experience. Moreover, the AFL-CIO president established a Union Cities initiative to spur organizing at the regional level, which had been more abundant prior to Sweeney's 1995 election. Besides providing the necessary funding and staff support, the program was designed to promote cross-fertilization of ideas and to revivify the inactive central labor councils. Additionally, this effort strengthened the AFL-CIO's political program while contributing to expanded mutual support networks, which were crucial for organizing campaigns and the successful negotiation of labor contracts. Unlike his business unionist predecessors, Sweeney was highly visible as the AFL-CIO president in backing unionization drives among diverse groups, including California strawberry pickers, South Florida nursing home employees, Las Vegas construction workers, airport employees in Los Angeles and San Francisco, and, Lu and South Louisiana maritime workers. Furthermore, he generated ex extensive trade union support for internationally and historically significant rallies in Seattle and Miami while traveling throughout the United States, speaking out in support of immigrant workers' rights and in defense of laid off Enron employees. Sweeney also was influential in directing and encouraging city federations such as the Los Angeles County Federation of Labor, to become active participants in local living wage movements, which have led to the implementation of many living wage statutes in both large and small U.S. cities. Although union density continued to plummet under Sweeney, compared with the previous regimes of Meany and Kirkland, there were some positive developments made under the new voice Slate's administration. For example, for the first time in decades, Sweeney returned labor to the center of the American Liberal Coalition through the AFL-CIO's involvement with various social movements, including anti-globalization, anti-sweatshop, environmental, and immigrant groups. And while the current quantity of National Labor Relations Board certification elections is less than a third of the more than 6,000 elections held annually in the early 1980s, the average victory rate while Sweeney headed the Federation was 61% compared with 51% during the Kirkland years. Moreover, BLS union membership data indicated that the total number of union members increased by 2.7% while Sweeney was in office compared to a 5.3% decline under Kirkland's tenure. Granted that this union membership growth is minuscule and occurred during 2007 and 2008, it remains the first time since the collection of annual membership data by the BLS commenced a quarter of a century ago, that even a slight uptick in overall membership has been registered. In spite of these minor achievements, the strategy that, Sweeney, that the Sweeney regime adopted was fundamentally flawed. This approach can best be described as being representative of a kind of social movement unionism from above, one that was initiated, controlled, and managed by the AFL-CIO's bureaucracy as that was determined and guided by the direct involvement of rank-and-file members themselves. As an example, while Sweeney expressed commitment to dramatically increasing the number of union members, 
through the allocation of additional resources to union organizing, he attempted to accomplish this goal through utilizing professional organizers rather than converting rank and file unionists into organizers themselves through providing the necessary training and education. Sweeney remained attached to this strategy despite the results of an AFL-CIO leadership commission study which found that unions achieved victory in 73% of the certification elections in which rank and file members served as organizers compared to winning only 27% of the time when only professional organizers were utilized. A second crucial characteristic of the social movement unionism from above approach was Sweeney's reliance on Washington-based tactics, which also lacked significant rank-and-file worker input in either their conceptualization or execution. Undoubtedly, Sweeney felt more at home through using ostensible experts connected with institutes and policy centers in proposing solutions for resolving labor's woes and then publicizing them through clever and expensive media and marketing campaigns. Although these pre presentations were highly professional, they failed to generate creative energy among unionists themselves, which is ultimately what is required to have a chance to revitalize the US trade union movement. Clearly, a social movement unionism from above, as implemented by Sweeney, is preferable to an entrenched and sclerotic business unionism of the Meany and Kirkland years. But such an approach does not go far enough in laying the groundwork for what is needed to revive the US trade union movement in an era confronted by hyperglobalization, inadequate legal protection, and the recent attacks by state governments on public sector unions. Trade unionists desirous of reversing the existing state of affairs must transcend a social movement unionism from above orientation if they hope to redirect the path of labor. Instead of Sweeney's approach, I propose an, as, as an alternative a social movement unionism from below strategy. The defining feature of a social movement unionism from below is undoubtedly democracy. But what I mean by democracy in this case is not union democracy as is traditionally understood and defined by the Union Members' Bill of Rights as contained in the 1959 Landrum-Griffin Act. Such protections from the Landrum-Griffin Act include the right to nominate candidates for union office, to vote in union elections and or referendums, to attend and participate in union meetings, to provide criticisms of union officials, to express, to express any perspective at union meetings, to circulate literature outside the union meeting place, and to conduct separate, separate meetings without the involvement of union officers. In a social movement unionism from below, I believe democracy must extend beyond union democracy to include working class democracy, where the union fights for the interests of the working class as a whole and not just for the sectoral interests of its official members. The impetus for such working class democracy must derive from the creative energy of all workers, union and non-union alike, as well as allies who have a stake in the future of a vibrant U.S. trade union movement. Thus, at a minimum, what is required and desirable in the implementation of a social movement unionism from below is the active participation of rank and file workers in channeling their own creative energy into generating initiatives and charting the course for a re-engineered labor movement. Although it is impossible to, pro to provide a blueprint of what a fully developed social movement unionism from below would ultimately look like, I would like to discuss some recent examples from the US trade union movement that I believe are consistent with the beginnings of such an approach while sketching out a number of theoretical ideas that I believe need to be considered in order to successfully achieve the construction of such an orientation. In addition to creating a different relationship between rank and file trade unionists and union leaders as found in business unionism and social movement unionism from above, an example of recent tactics consistent with the social movement unionism from below is the United Food and Commercial Workers Union organizing success at Smithfield Foods in North Carolina after a multi-year struggle. Due primarily to a minority and immigrant workforce taking ownership of the unionization drive rather than relying on unions professional staff to lead the campaign, the workers achieved in December 2008 a certification election victory and employer recognition of the union. Some of the key events contributing to this tremendous success indicate the workers taking initiative and executing various strategies devised on their own. In 2003, for example, sanitation crew workers walked out to demonstrate their opposition to the plant's poor wages and working conditions, which led these workers to attain a number of employer concessions. 
With the widespread occurrence of immigrant rights protests throughout the nation on May Day 2006, workers took the day off and shut down production at the Smithfield plant. In November 2006, when the company terminated 75 immigrant workers and made threats to fire hundreds more because of alleged social security number inconsistencies, a two-day strike that included black, white, and Latino workers resulted in the company rehiring all the fired workers. Shortly thereafter, union supporters gathered 4,000 signatures on a petition demanding that, beginning in 2007, Martin Luther King's birthday be made a paid holiday for all employees. Upon management's refusal to meet this demand, approximately 400 workers remained absent from work that day. This action undoubtedly caught management's attention because in 2008, for the first time, Smithfield granted the holiday to workers at every one of its non-union facilities. A second example representative of this of the start of this type of social movement unionism is the victorious plant occupation that the United Electrical Workers, are also known as the UE, local 1110 members held against Republic Door and Window in Chicago in December 2008, where a primarily immigrant workforce, in struggling to obtain the wages and severance pay that the company owed them, decided to take matters into their own hands after the factory closed with only a two-day notice. Reminiscent of the wave of sit-down strikes that swept the United States from 1936 to 1938, 200 of the 240 factory workers occupied the plant on December 5th, the day the factory closed. Lasting six days, the sit-down strike ended when the union local negotiated a $1.75 million settlement with the company, which included vacation time, severance pay, and temporary health care benefits. Besides encouraging rank-and-file trade unionists to utilize their creative energies in devising their own strategies, I believe that the collective bargaining approach of a labor organization adopting social movement unionism from below must go beyond merely trying to obtain the best labor contracts for union members, per se. The vision of such a unionism's collective bargaining strategy should become a mechanism for fighting for positive social change, such as repairing problematic industries, providing economic opportunities, and modifying business practices that harm communities and destroy the environment. In order to accomplish this, community representatives and non-union workers must benefit from unionism so that they have a direct interest in seeing workers organized into labor organizations. Thus, it is necessary to incorporate these two constituencies into the union's negotiation committee. How would this type of unionism actually function in practice? As an example, in the private sector, we can examine the troubles in the domestic auto industry, which was exacerbated by the financial crisis of 2008 to 2009. Without posing any potential solutions of its own, the United Auto Workers, or UAW, adopted a defensive posture and immediately accepted the Obama administration auto task forces directive to reduce wages and benefits to the level of the non-union transplants. Although the lower tier in the two-tier wage system was $14 per hour, which was far below that of the transplants. The union strategy was clearly to try to preserve as many jobs as it could in a declining domestic auto industry that would continue to outsource jobs. But what if the UAW had some foresight and had begun to formulate a different strategy several years before the crisis hit? What if the union had begun to organize both unionized and non-union auto workers, environmentalists, and community activists around an alternative program? For example, upon the onset of the crisis, the union could have argued that it represented all auto workers as well as environmentalists in the communities where these groups reside. Instead of agreeing with the federal government to invest $100 billion in particular auto companies, the UAW could have called for this funding to be used to establish an auto reconstruction agency which would have the power to restructure and refinance the auto industry. As part of its proposal, the union could have integrated all union and non-union auto workers, environmentalists, community activists, consumers, etc., around the union agreeing to reopen all auto industry contracts if and only if the UAW would be allowed to negotiate over a number of items with the auto companies traditionally not found in collective bargaining agreements. Such negotiations could have included bargaining over the manufacturing of green cars, the actual kind of cars to be produced, the levels of executive pay, wages of workers who lost their jobs due to outsourcing, as well as the allocation of taxpayer bailout funds. 
This approach would potentially lead to opportunities to expand the auto industry's manufacturing base to economically benefit communities where auto plants are currently located, as well as to unionize many non-union workers in the auto sector. In an example dealing with public sector labor, there are current attempts to defund some public schools and to create charter schools in their place because of the ostensible failure of many of these institutions to provide quality education for students. What about integrating representatives of parent groups and student organizations into the bargaining committees of the National Education Association and the American Federation of Teachers so that these constituent groups have influence in negotiations? Such an arrangement would demonstrate to parents and students that unions are not counterposed to their interests, but are concerned with providing a quality education within the constraints provided by various political interests. Representatives from parent groups and student organizations should be involved in collective bargaining ne negotiations because they have concerns including class size, allocation of resources devoted to educational and extracurricular programs, etc. Additionally, since there are inordinately high turnover rates in the teaching industry, parents and students have a vested interest in teachers' wages, benefits, and working conditions because these issues directly impact the students' learning conditions. Additionally, such an expansive collective bargaining strategy could lead to stronger support for unions as a whole if these constituencies come to believe that labor truly has their best interests at heart. Under such a situation, trade unions would no longer be seen as job trusts for their members. This could contribute to wider and deeper support for the union's legislative programs and put more pressure on legislators to pass labor's agenda if the citizenry as a whole actually possessed reasons to support the union's political program. From Carter through Obama, labor used its political muscle to help elect these Democrats although labor law reform never became a legislative priority because other bills, according to these Democratic presidents, had to come first. When it came time to placing labor's bills on the table, these administrations' political capital was spent so nothing significant ever was accomplished. If the U.S. trade union movement could derive more support for its legislative program, through a supportive citizenry, there is a higher probability that labor would be successful. Let me conclude with what I believe to be historical examples of this type of working class democracy that occurred during another tough economic climate to demonstrate that social movement unionism from below possesses the capacity to dramatically reshape the US trade union movement. During the height of the Great Depression, three strikes in 1934 led by small groups of political radicals marked a militant mass labor movement which paved the way for the emerging industrial unionism of the CIO. A small group of socialists affiliated to the American Workers' Party, who had been organizing unemployed workers in Toledo for over a year, headed the victorious Toledo auto light strike, which led to extensive unionization in Toledo. In Minneapolis, a band of Trotskyists connected with Teamsters Local 574 led a successful strike against the city's trucking companies, which resulted in widespread unionization in Minneapolis. And in San Francisco, the Communist Party major role in the 1934 West Coast Longshoremen's Strike was instrumental in contributing to the unionization of all of the U.S. West Coast ports. Not only did these strikes demonstrate that viable industrial unions could be built, but also, according to some scholars, these events were the decisive factor contributing to the Wagner Act's passage in June 1935. And although not directly related to unionization per se, but a much more recent collective action representing the spirit and vibrancy of the practice of social movement unionism from below, and concerned with many of the same issues, is the Occupy Wall Street movement, which gained tremendous support in the fall of 2011. This movement began with just 12 people, far fewer than the numbers involved initially in organizing the, 1930, the three 1934 strikes. A bottom-up social movement unionism hardly guarantees that the events of 1934 will be repeated in the near future or that success will necessarily occur. Moreover, such a democratic approach will neither be smooth nor linear and at times may be even messy, chaotic, and problematic. Moreover, this type of unionism also offers un unfortunately no assurance that a definitive victory is forthcoming or even will be attained in the far-off future. But what can be asserted undeniably is the following. By implementing this brand of unionism, rank-and-file unionists will unquestionably form a deeper and lasting commitment to train unions as their own organizations, which will enable labor to effective, 
to effectively represent all workers' interests. The creation of a social movement unionism from below, if and when it occurs, in and of itself, would be a landmark event in U.S. labor history. Given the dwindling options left and the immense challenges ahead, it does perhaps offer the best route for any type of true trade union movement revival in the United States. Thank you.